tonight we have a subject that I'm sure many of you have experienced uh, at some point in your life, uh, whether you have lost a parent or a sibling or everything in your world seems to have just crashed. And it was a moment when you just wanted to yell or scream at God, right? And you said you probably had the thoughts of, where are you? I thought you were here. I thought you were with me. I thought you loved me. Are you not listening to me? Is there too many people in the world for you to look at me, Lord? Where are you? Why did you let all of this happen? Right? Those could be some of the things that you've once thought about. If I raise a hand, how many people think that the devil lives down there? How many? All right. How many people think that the devil roams the earth? Oh, I've met some devil people, devilish people, right? I could almost date some of the moments I've met them. Well, the answer is that Satan is roaming the earth. And it says it in the Bible, and tonight we're going to take a look at the book of Job. Um, this is not the book of job. This is not how you get a job. These are no instructions for a job. This is Job. So if you were to um, write down letters to pronounce possibly how you would pronounce it, you might would say J-O-B-E just so that you don't say job, right? Yes, Job. And this character um, in this story took place, they think, back in the Genesis times, and they have a lot of scholars that have a lot of reasons and um, that they can outline why it was written when it was. Um, and because things were measured in his life by his riches were measured by how many things he owned, how many cattle, how many sheep, how many, all of these things. And so back then in the anarchy days, they counted what you had as your worth. All right. Um, and so th they think that this was written back in then. Well, Satan does roam the earth, and when Jesus comes back, he will put that Satan will go to hell and he will burn with all the people that have chosen to turn away from God and not accept God. So a week ago Monday, does anybody know what the date is? Uh, well, okay, first of all, let's not forget at the end of tonight, we're going to play the 21st of September, right, the song, because today is the 21st of September. All right, so don't let me forget. But does anybody know what happened, not this past Monday, but what the date was last Monday? What was it? 9-11. All right. So a week ago Monday was forever in our history books. My, um, my great-grandchildren one day and your, some of y'all's great-grandchildren one day We'll read about 9-11 as if it was something in some cold war that we were never around in, and, and they'll be listening and trying to grasp what actually happened and take tests on it, whereas some of us were alive and living that day, right? All right, all y'all, shh. It's been 22 years now, all right, since 9-11. Terrorist attacks killed almost 3,000 people and injured many, many other thousands in the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and then in Somerset County, Pennsylvania. There are times in our life that we will always remember, um, and some of you um, that aren't old enough, like I said, you'll, you'll read about it later, but some people in the room, um, not myself on this one, but some people, do you remember the assassination of Kennedy in 1963 and where you were? When Neil Armstrong walked on the moon in 1969. Then in 1986, at about 11.38 a.m., it was fourth period, and I was sitting in a classroom where the TD was on a push cart, and it interrupted our lesson plan so that we could watch the Challenger go up in space. And in 73 seconds of our eyes locked in on this t t old-fashioned TD set, we watched seven people become ashes in the sky. It was unbelievable. No, no one could have prepared what was happening, or I don't think they would have had us young children glued in front of the TV set witnessing something that was such a tragedy. And all of these times, you know, we want to go, what just happened? And then we had the events of 9-11. 
And some of the events seem to have happened so long ago, right? Like the Challenger, but some of them like 9-11 doesn't seem like it's been 22 years. Um, I remember exactly where I was. Um, I was working um, over in uh, where you know PetSmart to be. I was working in that shopping center and there was Bear Rock Cafe. Okay, for anybody that remembers Bear Rock Cafe. I had stepped next door to where I was working to purchase a, a large sweet tea and a muffin. Okay, anybody knows me, I'm not going to eat healthy. <laughs> That's why we got the weight. But uh, I stepped over to Bear Rock Cafe to get something to eat when the TV at the restaurant stopped with the breaking news. All right, and at first we thought, oh my gosh, remember they said that when the year, when the calendar year turned over to 2000, we were worried if the computers could figure it out. Do y'all remember that? It was called the millennial bug. And we were wondering if everything was going to crash. Like, how were the, how would the computers understand rolling over to 2000? What was that going to do? So at first we thought, uh-huh. First thought was none of the air traffic controllers, everything went haywire. And now all the planes are just floating up there. Nobody has any directional signs, no stoplights, no, like, you can't land right now and that they had hit the building. But then the second building got hit with a second airplane, and we were standing there going, oh, no. And then something happened at the White House, and then the, you know, all these things started happening at the Pentagon. Um, and that's when we began to say, well, what, what is happening? We were all scratching our heads and looking around, and then they came across the news and said, it might be an attack. It might be... Um, something other than us thinking that it's the, this millennial bug. So um, it was a dreadful day, of course, and I'm assuming that if you do remember that, you also remember where you were. This is just one of the many, many families. This is the Pueblibo family, and they had seven children. The father on the right side of the screen is a firefighter in New York, okay? He's minding his own business. He's at work, right? If you get a fire, you go, you put it out, you save the people when you come home and everything's a good day and you walk in the house and you tell your wife that, you know, you were busy today, but um, it, it was a good day. This man didn't make it out. They have video coverage of him talking to everyone, telling them so far the stair rail is safe, go in the stair rail and keep walking up the flight of steps and getting the people out. And in a matter of minutes, the building crumbled and this man lost his life and these seven children didn't get to say goodbye. That morning, he had told the youngest child, not the little one in the arms, but the youngest child, they had breakfast and he tickled her and he poured her, her um, cereal and everything but she had gotten up too early for school so after she had her cereal he tucked her back into bed and said you need to go back to bed because your mama's gonna be up in a minute and you don't need to be up right now and that was the last thing that they remember the seven children this woman was left to raise she was questioned is she competent to be able to handle seven children on her own this is a lot to have to face um and there were people coming in and out of her lives trying to decide if some of the children needed to be put in foster care because it was too many for her to handle. They were able to hold on, but four years later, she was diagnosed with an advanced stage of colon cancer and she died, leaving these seven children to figure it out. They had some people come and go out of the home, but basically the children raised the children. All right, the oldest stayed around and made sure that the youngest um, had gotten what they needed and that sort of thing. And they kind of grew right up there in that house. The older two ended up getting married and moving on. But as the children aged up, um, they stuck together. That is just only one story of many that came out of 9-11. Now, now I would like to play for you something that I found online from the NPR project. They have set up a phone booth for people that have lost loved ones to come and communicate with them. You will see in these videos 
that their individual experiences offer insight into the nature of grief and how it changes or doesn't change over time. This was just two of the many examples from this project. Hi, Dad. I miss you so much. I admit that for the first few weeks that you were missing, I thought that you were still alive, recovering in a hospital somewhere with minor injuries. It was pretty naive thought, but after all, I was only 11 years old. I've looked after mom and Caitlin, but it hasn't been easy growing up without you by my side. The last time you saw Caitlin, she was five years old and she came downstairs to have breakfast with you. And then you tucked her back in bed and said, I'll see you later, Caitlin, baby. Caitlin joined you in heaven four years ago. Just one month shy of her 21st birthday. We just dedicated a playground in memory of you and Caitlin. I love you forever, and butterfly kisses always, until we meet again. Bye, Dad. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, didn't realize how weird this would be, but, you know, Dad, uh, just, you know, thinking about you lately, and, you know, you left us on a Tuesday like this. Stupidly lost my vision five months later, which, you know, it's good you not, good you weren't here for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, Jesse and, Nico doing doing really good. Mommy's doing good. Now I'm getting married soon, so you know, just got engaged, so it's my beautiful Zoe and you know, I wish you were gonna be here with us for that. Um Walking around with this stupid cane sucks. Uh lost a vision five months after you died, I lost you and my vision all at once, you know, I hate it and, you know, it really upsets me all, like, you know, to no end sometimes, you know, and I guess that's why I get angry sometimes, so easily sometimes. Um, Miss you, I wish I had you here to talk to you about, about, about it and stuff, and you could put me straight, you know, put me in my place when I get upset about it and stuff, and that's why I need you. That's why we need you here. Um, I just, uh, Mets ain't doing so good right now, they just collapsed, so, in their season, so. Oh, well, 2021, that's how it goes, I guess. No, it's just, it's just how it is. I didn't think I would get so emotional doing this. <laughs> um... 
miss being on the ferry with you and you take me home from work once in a while and wish I can go home from work one one day and meet you down at the ferry, you know, I think that would be would have been awesome. Huh? Um uh, I just <laughs> I love that sound that one. It always brings me back. It's been a time. Um yeah, wow. I'm trying to like, you know, learn how learn a little bit how to make like repairs in my own home, like you would do, and it makes me feel happy when, like, even if I just change a light bulb or screw in a door handle that that got loose or something, that just that makes me feel good to know that like I did that. And, you know, I think in some way you might be a little proud of me doing that. Uh, hopefully, I make you proud what I'm doing in life. I love you, Dad. Just miss you, Yaren. Wish you were gonna wish you were here with all of us. Love you. Talk to you soon. imagine how many of those stories were like that and how many people probably yelled out and said why that was my family Lord that was everything that you blessed me with and you took it all away why did it have to be my dad or my mom or my child or they lost everything in that one day and so the, the biggest question is why does God allow suffering Another question arises in tragedies and where was he? Where was God? In the beginning, that question was asked by who, um, by those people that were in such great pain and those who lost the loved ones in the attack. It was also asked of the people who were angry and wanted to blame someone or something for what had happened to them. This was the question uh, that was thrown at God. Where were you? You should have kept this from happening. And there are some who genuinely ask the question out of a hurting heart, desperate to understand how such a thing could have happened. Where were you, God? Why did this happen? Why did my husband, my wife, my child, my friend have to die? But there's a book in the Bible that is um, quite devastating in the first part to ever read, and that is the book of Job. And even though um, you can't, that we cannot see angels, the Lord can. And once angels came before the Lord and Satan came with them, okay, because remember I told you Satan is on earth. Satan thought that he was smarter than God and he wanted everyone in the world to be bad. He could not believe that the people loved God and wanted to be good. And so the Lord told him that a man named Job was a very good man. God said, J Job has always wanted to do right and he's always loved me so very much. Satan knew that about Job. And let me tell you a little bit about Job. He lived in a land called Uz, U-Z. He loved God very much, and God had blessed him with his life. And that was obvious because he had seven children, three daughters. He had tons of livestock. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yokes of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and lots more, right? Right? He was the greatest man in the land of the east, and he was very, very rich. Job's children loved each other, and they loved him. Imagine all them children getting along. They grew up, and they had their own houses, but they still liked to visit their dad. Dad is Job. Sometimes they would get together at each other's houses, and they'd celebrate birthdays and that sort of thing, because they, they, they liked each other. All right, so the, the book of Job will all of a sudden take a turn. It goes from telling you about Job and him being rich and all the, the ways he's been blessed by God, all of a sudden the conversation switches, and now it's a conversation happening up in, with God and the angels and Satan. And this is the conversation. Satan asked to test twice, all right? Test number one. Satan says, God... Job only loves you because you've given him all these things. 
You've made him rich man. You've made him a good looking man. He's got a good wife. He's got all these children, all these cattle. No wonder he likes you. No wonder he loves you. But I tell you what, if I was to, if I was to curse him, if I was to take everything away, he'd end up cursing you back, and he wouldn't like you then. The Lord said, no, nah, I don't think you're right about that. See, I know Job, and I know his heart. And I know that if you were to strip everything away, if his family were in that 9-11 attack, and he lost everything, that Job would still love me, and he would still worship me. And Satan said, ah, I doubt that. Well, he, God said, okay. So God allowed Satan, see that's what's very hard to swallow, is that Satan can't do anything on his own to you without God's approval. And so that begs the question, then why would God want to hurt me? Why would he want to upset me? Why would he want to do something so terrible, right? That's the, that's the big question. All right, but he allows Satan to take away some of his things. So this is what happened. Three, uh, three things happened really fast, all right? A messenger came, all right, and said to Job that the enemies have attacked your flock. They've stolen all of your oxen, your donkey, and he's killed all of your servants except me who escaped and I was able to come tell you. And he's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Well, before he can ever get over that, here comes another, another man running up to him. Job, Job, guess what? Lightning struck and burned up all the sheep. And he's like, what? Oh my gosh, that's two horrible things. And then another messenger, he's running and he's running and he's catching up to him and he goes, oh my gosh, there was a raid on the camp and you've lost all of your camels and all of the service, everything is dead on the farm. And he's like, oh my gosh, I can't take anymore. All right, so he's very, very sad, but he's thinking to himself, hey, I've still got my family. That's the one good thing that I have. And before he could ever finish that sentence, a fourth man came running up. And he said, guess what, Job, I'm so sorry, but there was a tornado back at home. And it hit all four sides of the house. And it tore it up and all your children, everybody's dead. Your wife, everything's gone. Not your wife. All the children are gone. Can you imagine how sad Job was? In an instant, just like 9-11, in a snap of a finger, everything is gone right in front of him. Except for his wife. Job was so upset that he tore his robe, which was a sign that they used to do. He used to tear their robe and shave their head, and he fell down on the ground. And what did he do? He began to pray. Now, I honestly don't know in that very moment what I would do. I would hope that I would have done what Job did, but I think a lot of us, our first thing would just be to just get mad and angry, right? So after that had happened, that wasn't enough. Uh, Job had proved Satan wrong. Satan said that Job would curse God if he took everything away, and Job didn't. He blessed God. So Satan went back to God and said, God, I need to do a second round here. And God said, what, what are you going to do? And he said, I want to put sores, big sores, all over Job's body from head to toe. He won't be able to walk. He'll be hurting, he'll be in pain, it'll be a disease, and that's how I'm going to get him. That's how I'm going to prove to you that if you took everything away from somebody in this room right now, that they wouldn't follow you, they wouldn't believe you. And God said, all right, do it, but don't harm them, don't kill them. So he did. And when he did, Job couldn't move. He was sore, he was, he was hurting, he was taking pain medication, he had been to the ED, he had been to urgent care, nobody could help him. He was just, he was hurting. He was in so much pain. And his wife said, I told you, you should have cursed that God and just given up. And why don't you just die? Job's like, that's, you, you're talking foolish, woman. Well, so he's out there and he's got four friends. And the four friends hear about how, how Job's luck has turned. And he goes and he visits them. And he doesn't, they don't say a word to him for seven days. Imagine if you're in pain and you're crying and you're hurting and your friends come to see you and they just sit there for seven days and don't say a word, you know, that's kind of strange. And then when they finally do talk, they talk foolishness. They start saying, Job, you, you're lying. You must have done something wrong. You must have cheated. You must have stolen. You, you must have, uh, I don't know, cheated somebody out of some money. It's your fault. Job said, I didn't. I promise I didn't. 
I'm a good man. I'm a good, honest man. Well, eventually Job begins to question himself. Why was I even born, God? Why didn't you just kill me as a baby? Why am I even alive? He started second guessing. And finally, the Lord spoke to him. And he told Job that he should always trust God, even when he didn't understand what was going on. After all, how can any of us understand what is going on? No one knows as much as God because God knows everything. Let's talk about feathers for a second. The feathers of a bird. People may know about birds, but only God knows how the birds are able to fly with those wings. The wings, they're lightweight. A feather is weightless. How in the world can you add up four feathers or 20 feathers or 27 feathers and be able to hold your body weight and fly in the air? I can't understand that. If you've ever held a feather, think about it. Or if you've ever seen the bird get born, it doesn't even have long feathers yet. And then look at that peacock feather and look at that brown and white one. How in the world does it know to symmetrically grow and color itself in those particular designs? It's amazing. It's beyond our imagination. We can't fathom the things that God is doing and that what God knows and how he's controlling everything. I, I, I don't know how to do that. Do y'all know how to do that? Do you know how to make a feather grow and grow symmetrically to be that beautiful? How do you, how do, you do that? Only God knows. And look at the smaller detail. Let's just look it up close. Look at that white one on the bottom. How many tiny, tiny hairs? That's the same thing that it says in the Bible that God knows every single hair on the top of your head. Oh my gosh. Look at every stem of that feather has little tiny feathers. And it's perfectly made. I don't even think, I, mean, I can't even paint perfect. I can paint, but I can't paint perfect. God makes everything perfect. And it's beyond our imagination. This is why we can't understand why some things happen, right? He, he, God is just so smart. Job learned an important lesson about God. He already knew that God loved him. And he knew that God was wiser and stronger than, than anything on earth. God knew, Job knew that he could trust God. God caused all of Satan's wickedness towards Job to be stopped. He put a stop to it. And he gave Job twice as much as he had, except for the children. He just he made sure he had the exact same number of children again. He blessed them all over again. So if he had 500 camels, he now gave them 1,000. If he had 1,000 oxen, he gave them 2,000. He doubled everything he had. But it wasn't a point of, okay, Job, you passed the test, so I'm going to bless you. No, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't it. The bigger question is, when, when do we trust God when we are suffering? Or do we doubt him? Do we curse him? Do we even walk away from him when the, when the going gets bad? When the 9-11 happens right in front of your eyes and you lose everyone, or, or someone in this room may have lost um, a husband, um, a spouse, or a sibling, or whatever you've lost. At that very moment, how did you respond? In the weeks after that, in the months after that, how did you respond? Will you see God in the storm at that exact moment? Or are you quick to walk away and stop going to church? 18 years later, or 22 years later, really, we're still trying to make sense of the tragedy of 9-11. We keep asking ourselves, where are you, God? And I firmly believe that as God promised to those who cry out to him, he is with us. I don't always know how God works or how he intervenes and how some people get blessed in front of your eyes and then some get blessed and we can't see it, so we say that they, that they got overlooked. I, I can't explain that. And in Z Isaiah 43, it says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. A hurricane in the Bahamas and the East Coast fires up and down the north. You know, we've got California over there burning. 
Um, other tragedies have happened and are happening in our lives right now. And I strongly believe that God um, is with us through all those things. And when a loved one dies, I believe God is with them, ushering them into in eternity with love, comfort, strength, and joy. And shortly after 9-11, someone wrote a poem. And it was an incredible poem. Let's see if I have it up here. Um, this poem was long, so I'll shorten it. But it was entitled, Meet Me in the Stairwell. And an unknown author also uh, answered some of his own questions. And this is how it went. It was entitled, Where Are You, God? And this is what God's response would be. I was on the 111th floor. Right here. I was on the 111th floor in a smoke-filled room with a man who called his wife to say goodbye. I was there to allow him to call his wife for that last time. I was at the base of the building with the priest ministering to the hundred of devastated souls. I was on all four of those planes in every seat and with every prayer. And in one line, the poem says, some met me for the first time on the 88th floor that day of 9-11, and some sought me with their last breath. They said, oh God, they cried out at the last minute. And some chose to ignore me, but I was there just as I promised. And when I heard that poem for the first time, I was like, holy cow, I, I, I couldn't believe it. Recalling the stories of maybe, you know, losing my grandmother or, lose, or hearing of other people losing their family. We should always see the presence of God with us and helping us through those traumatic times. So the answer to the question, where was God when happened to me? He was right here all the time. And when sickness, and this is what I want you to do every single time that you feel like your life is just spinning out of control and things are happening around you and you just want to yell and go, why? Why me? At that very moment, promise me that you will get on your knees in that, in that heat of that moment. You will get on your knees, you will raise your hands, and you will thank God for everything that he has given you at that very moment. He hears that. Don't be the one that says, I thought you loved me. You promised me that you were going to take care of me. You told me, your, or people told me that if I just went to church, that I was going to be okay. We don't know what he's doing. The mastermind is so complicated of, of what's happening and why people are dying and why people go in and out of our lives. We can't sort that out. And in the book of Job, he never really tells him why all that happened to him. But what came of that is Job strengthened his heart and knew that in every single moment I am to bow and I am to lift my hands and I'm to say thank you Lord 